Joining us now from our nation's capital, the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Sean Anschut Atlio. And we're very glad to welcome you to our program. Uh, National Chief, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks for having me. Not at all. I want to ask you first about the business that goes on in that building behind you. And to that end, uh, I wonder what kind of a grade you would give the Harper government for its handling of First Nations issues. Well, the grade that First Nations would give uh, this and so many other governments before it uh, is really uh, falling so far short of, um, of what's acceptable. Um, and now that uh, we're embarking in, in the throes of, of an election campaign, uh, certainly the Assembly of First Nations is uh, setting out some very clear priorities and some very clear questions to ask not only the outgoing um, government in this case, because uh, all parties are now uh, uh, up for election, but we'll be asking all, all parties questions about our key priorities in the area of firstly education, secondly the need to really transform the relationship which is not working right now between First Nations and governments, thirdly that we need to build our economies, create jobs with an eye to sustainability and caring for the environment, and uh, fourthly and lastly that we really still have some very basic health and safety needs in our communities, uh, First Nations, especially children and women so very vulnerable and so we'll be asking all parties uh, some very important questions in all four areas. Uh, we are going to unpack all of those issues during the course of our conversation today National Chief but I, I wonder if I can get you to comment on this. The current Minister of Indian and uh, Northern Affairs John Duncan said that quote since 2007 his government has addressed almost 350 specific claims across the country. He thinks that's progress. Do you not agree? Well, it's, it's nowhere near the progress that we need. I think, uh, you know, overall we're seeing some progress. Uh, um, absolutely, some claims are, are being settled. Uh, I think the apology made to uh, the residential school uh, survivors, uh, the endorsement of the United, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, these are important steps, but what we have not seen is that the rate and pace of positive change has yet to occur. We still have dire conditions in First Nations communities. We have, for example, 75,000 people uh, are exposed to unsafe drinking water in communities where we've got 114 communities with boil water advisories and a few that are, uh, that are in fact, uh, do not consume orders. You know, or major issues with, with, uh, with poverty and, uh, and also with uh, graduation rates in, in, uh, in education. We have a deep gap, a major disparity in funding and support for First Nations learners and so as a result, for example, we have a high school graduation rate that's just under 50 percent. And so, you know, while we've made some gains in, in some areas, I think it's really important to keep uh, perspective about that, uh, about that progress and to recognize that we have so much more work to do and so much further to go to really to uh, close the gap between uh, the, the standard of living uh, that uh, First Nations currently have and the rest that's enjoyed by the rest of uh, Canadians. Let me just follow up on the water angle that you raised there because uh, of course this government, um, uh, I was going to say spared no expense, but, but um, that's probably overdoing it. They certainly spent a lot of money putting signs up all over the country uh, indicating what monies they had invested in various infrastructure projects uh, f for much of Canada. And I wonder whether or not, you'll forgive the colloquial way I'm putting it here, did, did First Nations get their piece of that action? Well, it's uh, really no different between areas like uh, water and water infrastructure or issues like education. Um, really, the, uh, the, the pattern that has to change is this notion that those who uh, work in, in the buildings that, that are behind me in Parliament have all of the answers for our communities. Uh, this country, this very country, was built on a relationship, one that was nation to nation, uh, where treaties were forged, and those treaties and even the current uh, common law as well as uh, Section 35 of the Constitution and now most recently the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples calls on governments to work with First Nations to jointly design solutions for their future. So when it comes to things like water for example that has yet to happen in the manner which could really deliver results to First Nations communities. In areas of education uh, the best example is uh, really over a hundred years of uh, of uh, adverse impacts through the residential school system which is another example of uh, unilaterally uh, and externally imposed systems that do not support the growth and development of First Nations communities but, or First Nations learners. So I guess we really National need to break Chief, that pattern. I understand but I, I guess what I'm trying to find out is uh, when, when the national government wanted to for example give some money to a community uh, to improve a water filtration plant let's say 
uh, they consulted with the community and then they got it done. Are you saying there has to be kind of nation to nation, treaty to treaty negotiations before the national government could do that kind of a thing, such as improve the water filtration system in a First Nations community? Well, it's certainly something that uh, the Assembly of First Nations is responsible for supporting First Nations governments, who, like any government, have a right and responsibility to serve their people and to do so uh, based on the original treaty understanding and the relationship of, yes, that being a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. And so when it comes to uh, what happened most recently with the fall of the government, it meant that a bill that uh, First Nations were not supportive of, Bill S-11, uh, died on the order paper, order paper. And what I think this election affords us the opportunity to do is say that in our second major priority, we have to transform the relationship. One that's based on this notion that governments uh, have all the answers to uh, a new way of doing business that's framed by the UN declaration that First Nations have the right to free prior and informed consent about how to build a future uh, for their communities. And the only way to, to break this uh, history of conflict and history of great uh, uh, deep gap of misunderstanding between First Nations and the rest of Canada is for First Nations governments and uh, the federal crown treaty partner uh, to work together to design, in, in one instance, what's the best way to improve water conditions, or uh, who knows best than First Nations families and communities how to design an education system uh, that's going to work for their children. To have, uh, for example, an education, uh, a graduation rate in K-12 of less than 50 percent, or a post-secondary graduation rate that is around 8 percent when the mainstream Canadian population enjoys a graduation post-secondary rate of around 24 percent. We know that these gaps are so deep and we're talking about, you know, the loss of real human potential here. Uh, we are going to talk education in the second part of the program. Got a, uh, an important debate, I think, set up to t tackle that. But you referred to a piece of legislation in your last answer there that uh, I suspect many of our viewers don't know about. S-11 would have provided for what? Well, S-11 was uh, suggesting uh, uh, on the part of the government a way forward to, to address uh, clean drinking water. And on the one hand, we're very, very happy that the government uh, was drawing attention to this very important issue for the reasons that I stated earlier. Um, but what didn't occur, and, and this is part of the pr pattern that we need to change, is that there wasn't an understanding about what sort of resources and funding would be there uh, and whether or not First Nations would be directly involved, as they rightfully should be, in developing the regulations about... Uh, uh, how clean drinking water would uh, be developed and how it would be managed and how it would be sustained. And so in order to, to carry that work out, you need to have the involvement, of, and we do have First Nations uh, water experts, First Nations technicians all across the country who are working very hard under extremely difficult, sometimes impossible uh, conditions to deliver clean drinking water to the communities that they serve. And they simply do not have the support, nor the recognition, nor the resources to do that. And Bill S-11, uh, albeit perhaps well-intended, fall very far short. And First Nations were completely unified from coast to coast to coast that we needed to design a better way forward. And we felt uh, that uh, we were beginning to be heard uh, when I, I gave actually testimony not just once to the Senate Standing Committee on Aboriginal Affairs, uh, but in fact they invited me back a second time. And this doesn't happen very often at Senate Standing Committees that witnesses are invited back twice. And so. I had to continue to bring a very important message that First Nations are fully willing to work with uh, the federal government to design a much better approach that in the end uh, would mean doing the maximum uh, effectiveness with available resources, but make no mistake about it, uh, we're talking about uh, real life and death situations and the health and safety and the deep vulnerability uh, of especially uh, our elders uh, and our children uh, when it comes to the fact that uh, over 75,000 of them are exposed to uh, the, the lack of, uh, of safe and clean drinking water. Admittedly, a National Chief, we are only in the first week of this election campaign for 2011, uh, so I guess we shouldn't be necessarily despondent about the fact that First Nations issues haven't made it to above the fold in the newspapers yet. It's, it's been mostly about, I guess, talk of coalition, talk of the government's uh, culpability on ethical issues and so on. But you've got your questionnaire out there. You're asking the parties where they stand on various issues. I wonder if you've heard anything back from them yet on what you want to hear from them. We haven't heard uh, anything back, you know, during the election yet, no. And, and we certainly, um, you know, that, that is part of the, the challenge and part of the problem in, in addressing some of these issues 
is that from election to election, uh, First Nations issues really don't seem to end up with the kind of attention and priority that they rightfully deserve. Uh, Canada has, uh, in many ways, a, a positive international reputation for uh, human rights globally, uh, delivering clean drinking water to uh, Africa, building schools in places like uh, uh, South America. And yet, uh, as I speak with you, we know that there's over 60, 60 communities who need schools, very often in northern remote First Nations communities. Um, and, and of course, I've shared with you the, the concerns around issues like clean drinking water. And uh, of course, First Nations want to build economies. And you know, at a time when the mainstream uh, population is aging, uh, Canada is going to face a labor shortage by 2017. And yet over 50% of the First Nations communities are under the age of 23. It makes complete sense that for the health uh, economically as well as uh, uh, for the, the well-being of the country that we invest in First Nations communities and especially young people because there are tremendous economic challenges. Uh, who's going to pay for, uh, people are asking who's going to pay for other programs like health in the future of this country. Well, we know that if we close the employment and education gap with First Nations, looking to the young people, that by 2026 it could mean a contribution to the Canadian economy uh, of over $170 billion. And so I really do think it's time uh, that at this juncture in history of this country and at this election, that First Nations issues take a major uh, priority amongst all parties. And so we'll be really pressing for some answers to those questions that we put out there. And if by the end of the campaign you hear answers from one party versus another that you really like, will you endorse that party? Well, the Office of National Chief and the, and the position of the Assembly of First Nations is firstly nonpartisan. Uh, we do have a responsibility to support and advocate for First Nations governments and their citizens. And to do so, we're going to be very active. We're going to hold a, a virtual summit. Uh, we're going to uh, have a virtual summit with citizens from across the country. These have been very successful as of recent uh, so that we can exchange information and support First Nations citizens to understand and hear what the parties are, how they're responding to our questions, what their platforms are. Uh, we're going to uh, call for a debate uh, between uh, the, the parties on First Nations issues. We're going to be in social media. We're going to be blogging and we're going to be uh, uh, on Twitter and we're going to be using Facebook. And so it's really about empowering First Nation citizens to understand uh, what the issues are, what, what positions the candidates and the parties are taking, so that we can support them to take their uh, individual choice uh, about uh, how, to, uh, how to participate uh, in this election. Well, those are, no doubt, all important things to do in order to empower and get more participation out of First Nations communities. Uh, I guess the reality is uh, you got to vote, too. And I, I suspect one of the reasons that First Nations have um, not had as much attention from the parties in the past as you'd like them to is that uh, First Nations don't vote in numbers uh, like other demographic groups do. What are you going to do to make sure that you get your people out to the polls? Well, it's not my place to, um, as you put it, to get people out to the polls. Um, I have a, a personal uh, view of this uh, that is my own opinion. Um, I will be casting a ballot and I'll be doing my own analysis as an individual I think that personally it's one of the tools uh, to advocate uh, to have our issues understood and addressed. I do respect deeply uh, the fact that, as I said earlier, this nation was founded on treaties that are nation to nation and I respect fully and the organization takes a position that it is up to the nations and their citizens to decide um, if they're going to participate actively through vote or, or any other uh, practice with, uh, with uh, what's referred to as the Canadian uh, democratic system. I understand that, Chief, but you have, but you have, you have the legal right to choose who you want to have on the other side of that table that you negotiate with, and I, I understand that you're going to avail yourself of that right. But would you encourage your fellow First Nations citizens to do that as well? Well, what I would encourage uh, First Nations citizens is to understand that they have that right. In fact, many would argue that First Nations uh, veterans uh, fought for for many freedoms, including uh, the right to vote. And so you're absolutely right. Now, to be very clear, my role is to support First Nations uh, governments and their citizens to be, to be very aware of and understand uh, that they have that legal right and that they have a choice as to how or whether to exercise it. It isn't for me as a national advocate. I am not, as some people think, the head of First Nations governments in this country. My role is that of an advocate, and that means that I support First Nations governments, and that means I support them in every way, and that includes uh, whether they will uh, step forward and, in this case, uh, 
participate in, in voting with what they would suggest uh, is the nation that they in fact are allies with and have signed treaties with. So you're right that it is, uh, it is not the same for all First Nation citizens and not all First Nations uh, do vote in elections at various levels. However, there are those who do. And there are in fact many ridings in which the Aboriginal population uh, is beginning to grow to the extent that First Nations, if they choose, in great numbers could impact the outcome of elections. So that's the sort of information that I think that it, we're responsible for uh, supporting First Nations governments and First Nations citizens to understand. And we're going to carry out that responsibility over the course of this election. Understood. National Chief Adlio, it's good of you to join us on the line from Ottawa tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.